one to join our faithful band and answer the call to follow him. He said the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Come gather. Come gather in the service of the Lord. Oh, everybody, 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 come on. Come on in this house. Everybody, everybody, come on in this house. Everybody, everybody, come on in this house. Come on, come into the house of the Lord. Everybody, 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 come on. Good morning, church. He lives. He lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He lives. I, I, whoa, this is a little loud this morning. I'm Pastor Doug. I remember an Easter when I was growing up, they used to sing this song, He Lives. And it was call and response. He lives, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. I love that. The part I didn't love as much is when we got to that ending point where you, you say, you ask me how I know he lives, and everybody stretch for that note. He lives within my heart. I love that about our faith, because even when you're not quite feeling it, even when you're singing right about here, there's always something about Easter that invites us to stretch, to stretch beyond where we are to what's possible. So I am thankful to God. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, hallelujah. Welcome, welcome to National United Methodist Church where we seek to make the love of God obvious. Are we live streaming today? Amen. That isn't always the case and so we're just gonna thank, uh, thank God, thank the universe for its mercies, allowing Wi-Fi to work today. For those of you who are watching from home either uh, alongside of us right here on a Sunday morning or sometime later, we're so grateful to be in fellowship with you. And I'm so grateful that folks are gathered here in person at the Wesley campus. We'll offer another introduction to the Wesley campus in just a moment, but for now, I wanna make sure that you sign in if you're able to. There's a welcome card, let us know that you are here. Let me as one of your clergy know if there's a prayer concern that you'd like us to hold um, hold for you confidentially and pray with you about. Uh, you can turn those in when the usher comes forward a little bit later on in the service. But for now, let me just say how grateful I am that you've chosen to be in worship one way or another. Whether you felt like you could stretch toward Easter or not, we're gonna stretch together. So we're gonna invite God's help leading us, guiding us, and I invite you to stand as you are able, body, spirit, the faith we sing hymnals where you find the words. 22, 14, lead me, guide me. Let's sing together. Amen.
Greetings all, and welcome to Wesley, where we love the Lord and we love each other. And if you came in here today, we're going to wrap you up in that love, and you can't get away from it. So don't even try. Okay, we are glad you're here today, and let's just have a word of prayer with the Lord before we move on. And when you pray in Jesus' name, something will happen. In Jesus' name. So, Lord, we come to you right now. In the name of Jesus, we bring this prayer. First, we're thanking you, God, for the sacrifice of your precious son, Jesus, for us, to redeem us unworthy as we are. Lord, we thank you also for another night's sleep and a morning awakening. We thank you for the ability to gather once more to praise you to come together in community. Lord, you know, we are living in trying times, social and political unrest and confusion, lies being told as truth. Lord, things are really rough, but we are counting on you, Lord, because we know for millennia, for generations before us, you have been there and brought them through all these adversities. And we know you will do that for us too. We thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, there are sick among us, sick and grieving, and there are even those who don't know how to get the next step out, God. They are struggling. Be with them, we ask. We pray, God, send your Holy Ghost power. Rest it on them. Wrap them in it. Things are in a difficult stage in our country, around the world. But God, we are trusting in you. And Lord, as we go through this service, we pray that the words, the shared word, music, prayer, scripture, holy communion, and the preached word reach deep into hearts, strengthening them, and making us all aware that we, through you, have the power to bless, heal, and renew each other in the name of of Jesus. We lift this prayer, God. Amen. Amen. Now, as usual, we're going to just pass the peace. So you know I like to wrap you up tight before I make sure I get everybody wrapped up here. Wait a minute. <clears throat> okay, gotcha. Got everybody. If you don't feel it, let me know. Did you get All right. Yeah, I got right here. Yeah, I got him. I got everybody wrapped in this hug. Okay. May the peace of God be with you today, tomorrow, and always. God is so good. Let us pass the peace, people.
Grace and peace, friends. We are coming to a time where we offer our gifts to God, where we respond to uh, in gratitude to what's what we see around us, what we feel around us. I was talking to a brother earlier this morning who said this weather brought him to life. This is the kind of weather that helped him to feel um, feel positive about everything and good about God. I came into the door at the back of the church and I found this. And I'm not sure if I'm doing this correctly, but I love this. Whoever brought this gift to the church, where did this come from? Did someone bring this in as a, as a gift from somewhere else? This is a time for us to, to, to share the, the sense of the Spirit in our lives. I'm so grateful that Ola is here today to, to share the gift of, of song. Um, there's more of a testimony here, so is that something that's going to be shared before we have a chance to, to, to hear? Okay. So let me invite you, um, Usher, if you would just wait for just a moment, uh, just for a moment until we've had a chance to hear this testimony, and then there'll be an opportunity for listening and song, too. So just right after, right after the spoken piece, then we'll, we'll come forward during the song. Please come. Thank you for inviting me to give this poem today. Um, uh, I wrote this poem for a specific member of this church, but it goes to all the church elders, the special people of Wesley who have served this church for so many years. Many years ago, when I was the church council leader, we started a program called Seniors in the Hood. And we were in the hood, and we were celebrating the seniors in the hood. And today, although it's for one particular member, I celebrate all church elders. I too am ambassador. A humble house from St. Augustine, she traveled with her kin to New York. A small little girl with a big curious mind, waiting for a beautiful change to come. A neighborhood mother would chastise her children for playing with her, her being a darker-skinned child to the lighter-skinned lens of idealism. People like this neighbor were the fences in life who wanted to take the J out of joy. But you can focus on what is not right, or you can have the joy of dark meat of southern fried chicken. She would closely study her work, and even more closely study those around her. Her brother, running around with Frankie Lyman, oblivious to the entrapment, targeted so ever so insidiously to, in, to her communities. Her father serving Nat King Cole at Birdland, as she sips slowly on Shirley Temples with her life-size straw, taken in the silver-papered scene and the incessant beat of the harlem -esque renaissance of the new dance styles and the tall slim man with eloquent eyeglasses to be found standing on a box after church called red gathering an ever wandering crowd shirley was her name integrated knowledge was her game a teacher navigated her mind with the study of the language of france and of traveling the world stage, a seed to a journey, which began with work in advertising, a job in which she would excel, met by a future in the New York Times, in times when a woman, women who looked like her, were often too under-celebrated for their over-achievements. CUNY, BU, and Columbia in grounding an NYU professor is not as outstanding as the might of the journey, both professional and spiritual. That would take her to the crossroads of life and laid out by the Ford Foundation. In being, she was surely meaning ever intrigued, always studiously analyzing, but speaking out when something was not right always using her learned voice and not exercising voicelessness. A diplomatic career would take her to Europe to become the most senior ranking African-American woman in US history. Holding dinners with today's leaders and actual influencers, draped in chic style, fluent in French and international affairs. A petite frame behind crystal glass held of champagne would disguise her worldly wise, 
an ever-growing passion for the art of the African diaspora that would be avidly sought from Congo to Germany to New York to France. The palette of the disparate black stories shed by red paint and other hues. Her name is Shirley, now Miss Barnes to you. Ushered on to become a US ambassador to Madagascar, representing the President of the United States. Abroad, a place where she would deeply love and grow in heart, the many faces of the young girls would endear and cultivate a need to build a foundation to for the growth of many young girls she would adopt as students. She had a dream seen in the eyes of young girls, now curious about how big the world is, could be and should be for them. Ambassador is her name. Shirley by name, Shirley by nature. She once declared there were times she had the self, but not the will. And she had the will, but not the self. But she always had the unseen hands of the Lord carrying onwards to her humble greatness. My country tis of thee, sang Marian Anderson on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Humility in resounding victory. Ambassador Barnes, we thank you. That's a blessing when you hear a child sing.
I'm going to lead us in the, the, the dedicating our gifts for ministry, recognizing we'll have the opportunity at the end of the service to bring our gifts forward directly to the altar. If you didn't have your, your opportunity here, bring it straight to the altar. It's the right thing to do. Would you join with me? Work through us and our gifts, Lord, so that what comes to us as seed goes forth as flower, and what comes to us as flower goes forth as fruit. Amen. Christian, would you come at this time? Good morning. Today's reading is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of God for us, the children of God. Amen. I really am humbled to be able to stand and at the same microphone where Ms. Ola just offered uh, surprise after surprise. There are things I don't know about uh, uh, Ms. Shirley, about Ambassador Barnes. Um, and so to open that door just a bit to help me to appreciate um, just a slice of the story. Ambassador Barnes, we celebrate you. I know you have more. I'll take my time and move out of the way and make sure that there's, there's, there's time for some other folks to share too. But since I've been given the, uh, the, the yoke or the mantle or the opportunity to, to say a word of grace, uh, to, to help to magnify a bit of what we've heard in 1 John, I'll, I'll do just that. But I think we've already heard the message, which is that uh, when you allow the light of Christ to shine within yourself. Uh, people see a dimension of the world, a dimension of love that they couldn't imagine. I thought we were going to hear my country, tis of thee, and I, I couldn't breathe uh, because you opened a door for me. And so I'm gonna sit with that. I almost don't want to speak into that, that particular uh, wisdom that you've already given us, but uh, let me just invite prayer from all of you and for one another as we pray, God, to you, only what you would have us hear, only what your spirit draws us toward here, not toward a particular word, a particular person, but toward a bright light. God, we humbly come before you in this time of contemplating scripture, of contemplating what it means to live as your children, to walk in that light, to be bearers of your truth, but also people convicted by the truth. None of us is beyond and above the prejudice we bring to each different gathering. And so, God, you iron it out. You flatten things for us a bit so we can see ourselves and see you. And so help this preacher step back. And may the author of life step forward. Lead us. Guide us. On this journey, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to start with a, a, a story about Easter Sunday for me when I was still in college and I was on a tour with my friends. We were, it was the biggest trip we'd ever taken together, just four of us driving out from Louisiana out to the desert southwest and we went to Grand Canyon. I'm just wondering if you have any experience with the Grand Canyon. How many of you have, have stood kind of on the edge of the Grand Canyon and looked out? Many, not all. Some of you might say that that was a spiritual experience. It was for us, we were doing it during spring break. It was Easter morning. 
when we stood on the edge of uh, the, the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And when you're doing that, you're standing on native land. And they let you know this because all of the points, they say this is Navajo Point. And so you want to stop and think about where you're standing. Talk about the red door that leads into Wesley. Remember where you are. Remember your history, your heritage. And so as you move along, there's a Hopi point, there's a Shoshone point. You stand on all of these edges of the Grand Canyon, grounded in your people, in your tribe, in your history. But then when you're at the Grand Canyon and you're watching the sunrise, you also see these, these buttes, these mountains. They're like 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 elevation, foot high. And they all have names. I don't know if you knew this, but if you imagine yourself looking out at the Grand Canyon, they've got these names like um, the Confucius, Temple of Confucius, or the Temple of Vishnu, or the Temple of Krishna, or the Temple of Buddha. As you scan the whole horizon, it seems like everybody's got a temple. You've got, you've got Solomon's Temple here. You know that one, right? But there's Jupiter, there's Apollo, Every major religion seems to have a temple in the Grand Canyon except. And if you're like me, you're just wondering, well, why didn't anyone name any of these peaks in the world of Christianity? Sure, Solomon is in Judeo-Christian, but where's, where's the Jesus peak? <laughs> and it's Easter. I want to share with you this morning how I found Christianity in the Grand Canyon, how I found Jesus. And a little bit of a hint, it wasn't in the sunrise that we think is part of what it means to, to see Jesus rise. That's just paganism, just to watch the sunrise. I love the sun, I love spring, but that's not Jesus. Another little hint about where we find Christianity, how we locate Jesus after he is risen, the gospel writer John told someone else, the day is coming when people aren't going to go to a particular temple that has red doors or clear doors. The day is coming when people won't go to that building or that mountain and say, this is God. But the day is coming when people will worship God in what? Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Or to reflect a little bit more from some of the other gospels, the gospel of Luke, people are going to encounter Jesus not by sitting up in a temple or sitting in a contemplative pose on the edge of the Grand Canyon, but by feeling his hands. That's something that Jesus did and late in the Gospel of Luke. He said, if you don't trust that it's me, here, feel my hands. If you still don't trust, here, have a piece of broiled fish with me. Have any of you ever had broiled fish in this community? I had pompano, thank you. Pompano was served to me one day. This is one of the ways that we know Jesus. And the final little hint about where we find Christianity, where we find Jesus these days, is in the text you just heard. We will see him as he is, and we become like him. We become like him. It might be useless sitting up on a mountain or sitting on the edge of the Grand Canyon when, in fact, there's something else that helps people to see and know Christ. So that's what I want you to contemplate with me today. Where do we find Christ? People have told me all of my, my career, all through my calling, that all paths lead to God. All religious paths lead up that mountain to the one God. What do you think about that? All paths, all religious paths, all faiths lead to that one God. Doesn't matter what religion you choose, you'll all arrive at the same place. I like the way that feels. This person who wrote this book, Barbara Brown Taylor, entitled the book, Holy Envy, Finding God in the Faith of Others. And her particular perspective as a progressive woman, as one who was in the local church and then was invited to teach world religion in a school, she said that she started to fall in love with other religions, especially because of the frustration she found in her own Christian faith. This is just the way that it opens up. It's why I bought the book. It said, this is a small window on a large subject. Said at a private liberal arts college in the foothills of the Appalachians is a story of a Christian minister who lost her way in the church and found a new home in the classroom where the course she taught most often was not introduction to the New Testament, but religions of the world. As soon as she recovered from the shock of meeting God in so many new hats, 
she fell for every religion she taught. When she taught Judaism, she wanted to be a rabbi. When she taught Buddhism, she wanted to be a monk. It was only when she taught Christianity that the fire sputtered because her religion looked as different, looked so different once she saw it lined up with the others. She always promised her students that studying other faiths would not make them lose their own. Then she lost hers. At least she lost the one that she started out with. This is the story of how that happened and why. Holy envy. She would say at one point in her life that all of these different practices of religion lead to a one unified sense of God, to a kind of enlightenment. But here's the counterbalance, and it's in the book too. Do you know the story of the Tower of Babel? Tower of Babel? And so what we know about the story of the Tower of Babel is that it was, a, it was something that humans built. They all had this one sort of language, and so it, they, they used this one language to build this one tower, 6,000 foot elevation, 7,000 foot elevation, all toward the top. And the story in, in Genesis 11, I think it is, is where God confounded their religion, made it impossible for them to speak one language, and then suddenly sent them in multiple different directions with their multiple different languages. It's why the rabbis would say we have so many different languages, because we were not humble. We felt like we wanted to be as high as God, all of us speaking one language. She tells that story in the book, and, but she tells it from a different perspective, from a, a Ghanaian theologian named Emmanuel Larte. And he takes another look at that, that Tower of Babel, and he said it was God's judgment against assimilation and colonialism. That by dismantling that one peak, one language that could be used to dominate, one perspective that could dominate others, God tearing down Babel was God's tearing down of one culture to dominate all of the others. Tower of Babel. So there is this hubris in thinking that we can all arrive at one sort of enlightened point. Whose point is that? Which one of these temples? I would suggest to you that all religions don't lead to God. A God consciousness is something that comes to all of us when we are young. But the paths we take down the mountain will demonstrate God's presence. It matters which path down the mountain we take. So let me just put off the story of where I actually found Jesus at Easter time. It wasn't in the sunrise, and it wasn't on any of these different peaks. My experience of Jesus in life comes from engaging with people who are ethical people, people who strive to be righteous, people who strive for personal and social holiness. Not just the people who sit up on the top of the mountain, but the people who work their way down the mountain to others. Let me just give you an idea of, of how that happens. So I think that there are three stops on the way. You may think of many others, and I'm not saying that any of these, one, any of these particular stops are the only way or the wrong way. I didn't mean for Reggie to leave. I didn't mean to offend him. Okay, okay, we'll tell you when you get back. When you're, when you're having an experience of God that opens a bright place in your life that, where you have a strong sense of, of God's holiness, and it happens to all of us at one age or another. A child sang earlier, and we stopped just for a minute to recognize a child was singing. That bright light is there, but we lose it like Barbara Brown Taylor did. One thing that you find around that mountain is that there's always a visitor center. There's always an experience that some people have of religion where they, they think that they've got that religion and so they commodify it somehow. The visitor center in that life of faith is a place where you, you collect all of the maps, you collect all of the books, you get all of the perspectives. You don't have to actually climb anything or take any particular journey at the visitor center. I've been in a lot of those churches where it's enough just to come in and I got the book. I heard someone else's experience, the visitor center. 
And Grand Canyon had a great visitor center. It told us about all the cultures. It didn't fundamentally change us. It was fascinating. I've been in places of faith that were fascinating places that were not transformational. I think that those places are necessary for most of us. I've been in churches where that's where the journey begins in fascination. But if you go to the Grand Canyon and you park at the visitor center, what have you seen and what haven't you experienced? When you went to the Grand Canyon, what was your experience? What do you remember? Overwhelming. The depth, perception, the smells, the sense of the, the heat, the sense of history. You don't get that from the visitor center. You get an introduction. So we can be in the visitor center for a while, but we've got to leave the visitor center. And I suggest to you that the place that we would go next is a barren place. When you're coming down the mountain, you've got to spend some time in the purifying place. That was the point from 1 John. He said that we purify ourselves. We try to find righteousness. And then you go to, to national parks, they name a lot of things, high places after religious things, like Solomon's Temple, Vishnu, Krishna. And the low places, they tend to give to the devil. This is, this is, this is the devil's bed. This is the devil's creek. Have you seen those kinds of places? Have you seen those kind of places? the devil's den, have you been there? Because the religious life leads you to those devil places. Did for Jesus. Immediately after he's baptized, he spends some time with Satan. There is a kind of religious expression that drives us into the hot places, the necessary places of purification, where you figure out what you're made of. Our tradition is a tradition of the Desert Fathers in the second century. Desert Fathers and one of these guys called Anthony the Great was one of those who went out to the desert. He left all the, the, the creature comforts, he left the visitor center, he left home and he went to the hot places to work it out. To find, first of all, for him some inner forgiveness for what he had done. And you have to be old enough to have something worth <laughs> confessing. And so the desert fathers would go out and they would confess their own sins. They would pray constantly, sing constantly, because no one's around. They had to get away from the distractions for a while. And the desert fathers were direct, directly responsible for the United Methodists. Methodist tradition comes directly from that sense of stepping back away and finding one's sense of righteousness, purifying all of this stuff, the need to, to, to gain wealth, the need to be, to be popular and liked, to step back from all of that. That's what the Desert Fathers did, and it's what John Wesley insisted on. What time in the morning did John Wesley wake up? I don't even know if the clock goes back to like 4 a.m. I, I don't have any, 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 any kind of experience with 4 a.m. in the morning. John Wesley would get up at 4 a.m. in the morning. He would pray constantly. Must have been hell to get up that early to live the way that he did. But for him, he confronted the hell of his own insecurities. He found an inner sense of forgiveness. And what I said last Sunday was, if the church is going to have anything to do with this idea of he is risen. If we're going to lead anybody to believe that Christ is alive, people are going to come checking in the church first. If they don't find forgiveness in the church, and Christ isn't alive. Amen. So the Desert Fathers first had to find that forgiveness. They had to find also their own personal holiness. What kind of hell have you been through? What are you learning in the midst of your hell, in the midst of your rejection, or your suffering, or your pain? Think about it. Have you taken that time, or are you like the rest of us that try to get back to the visitor center in a hurry? <laughs> the Desert Fathers took their time in Del's, Devil's Den, Devil's Lake. Jesus spent his time in the low places and the hot places. Faith that leads to God probably leads through the desert, amen? amen. amen. It doesn't leave us in the desert. It certainly won't leave us in the visitor center. And so I want to offer them this third part of the journey. And the third part of the journey is base camp. Base camp. 
If you've not been hiking very much, you may not know much about the reality of base camp. You certainly won't find it if you're in the visitor center all the time or if you just stay on the hot highway all the time. But base camp is the place where people take care of one another. The people who have been out there risking, the people who are trying to make that journey of faith, it's where they come together and they heal one another. In the 1960s, base communities in Latin America, these are the communities of people who worked on one another's liberation. They started among the poor. Vatican II allowed for this concentration on the poor, but the Pope didn't understand it. He let that whole base camp, base community thing go. Couldn't understand why the church would be for the poor, of the poor, the poor. Base camps are the places where we heal one another. We get down off of our places of privilege and we walk among the people who are hurting. Jesus tried to show us this through the way of the cross. Have we learned? Here's a little lesson I learned just a couple of days ago. This is gonna be a father brag, may I, with my church? May I brag a little bit for, as a father? Thank you, thank you. You can do the same for me, with me about yourself, about your partner, about your child. My son won an award, uh, an award called the, the, the Polk Award in journalism, which is uh, one of those P's. It could be the Pulitzer, but this is the Polk Award. He's so young to get this award. And so because he was in New York City getting this thing, I got to be surrounded by all of these luminaries, these journalistic luminaries. These are the real heroes. We, we recognized how many journalists have died in Gaza more than any other conflict in Gaza. And so these journalists wouldn't allow us to forget that. But as I'm sitting there in one of these seminars, and it's like the, the former um, editors of New York Times, and um, oh, these, are, these, are just, these, are, these are famous folks that are up here in front of us, and this woman comes and sits down next to me, and she just flops down, and I feel like I recognize her from some, she was talking to, what's that guy on CNN who has white hair? Not Wolf Blitzer, he has a wife. Uh, Anderson Cooper. Anderson, if you're watching. Um, at, this, at this thing, Anderson Cooper was talking to this woman, and I thought she must be important. She sat down next to me, and she just looks at me, and she says, how are you doing? And I was mortified. And she thanked me for accompanying my son. She could tell that I was in this row with my son, and I was trying to find some way to open the door so we could hear more about her. And I, and I asked her, where, where did this whole thing start for you? Just to try to get, figure out why she's famous. Her name is Laurie Garrett. Laurie Garrett is the one who introduced the world to Ebola in Zaire. Sit next to me. I thought I remembered that from her bio, and so I was way out of my league to talk to this person about, about the experiences that she had. Let me tell you a little bit of her experience, but how it kind of opened up for me. I say, so where did this all start for you? Journalism, I want to say. And she said, in my mother's cancer. She said, I studied journalism, and that's what I thought I was going to do, but then my mother started to die of cancer, and she made me promise that I would be a doctor instead. And so she tried to honor her mother's promise, and she continued on to get advanced degrees in medicine. So she's a journalist and a doctor, in 1994, 1995, when she starts hearing these stories of Ebola, the most terrifying disease, where there was active misinformation going out about Ebola, you couldn't trust any of the sources with telling the truth of what's happening at the time in Zaire. And so she, with her medical background and her desire to tell the whole truth, joined the people and what was then Zaire, in the middle of all of that danger and risk, her, parent, her, her father begging her not to go. She went to Zaire, stayed in a convent, because they were the only ones that were willing to allow an outsider to come in and please tell us the truth of what's happening. And so for her work with Newsweek in 1995 and 1996 and telling the whole truth about Zaire, she got this Polk Award. It started in suffering, but she chose, because of the suffering, to be with the people who were suffering, to tell their story. And I'm sitting next to this woman, and I'm feeling like just a lump, a lump of clay. So much to learn. 
that is the temple that I have not yet visited well enough myself to completely go to be in those base camp, base communities, to genuinely care for, suffer with others. I know we have that intention. We all have that intention, but the church very rarely goes to that place of deep identification and solidarity. But Jesus imagined that the church could one day. We could be a people who could spend some time in the visitor center and you know, figure it all out, understand where the paths are. We would be people who would deal with our suffering and learn from our suffering and find forgiveness. The church can do that, but the church struggles with solidarity because we insulate ourselves with all of these other practices, or we insulate ourselves by thinking only of ourselves. But this person convicted me, just sitting beside me, to show me what's possible when you become a child of the light. So I had an early clue about this. I told you at the end I would, I would tell you how I found Jesus in the Grand Canyon. And it was after showering with a trucker. You don't want to hear more about that, showering with a trucker? Well, I'll tell the whole truth. Can I be, can I be honest here? It's 4 a.m. We got up early to watch the sunrise. I thought that I would have an experience of Jesus staring out there at the Grand Canyon. When the sun came up, I was sure that I would feel it in my ankles, that Christ is alive. But I didn't. It's never predictable like that, in my experience. And so I went to the truck stop instead. And we all went into the truck stop. And I sat down beside one of those truckers who makes me a little bit anxious because there's some big guys that just make me anxious. And I sat beside him, and he's just drinking his coffee. And I'm about to eat this omelet. And I don't know what it is about truckers, but they get giant plates of food. So I got this omelet that must have been made with 18 eggs, Thomas. And it's just, it's just heaving over my plate and so I decide I'm going to overcome my fear of this man and offer him a slice of my omelet. He asks for a plate, gets the omelet on his plate, and he opens the door a little bit to talking about his family. I open the door a little bit more, tell me about it. And this is back when you could show pictures of your family with your wallet. You pull out the pictures. And he shows me three grandchildren. He throws me, shows me the three grandchildren. And he puts his finger on their pictures, and he said, I'm not allowed to see them. He's got his hand on these pictures, shaking more than your hands, Ola. Hands shaking. I'm not allowed to see them because my son's wife won't allow it. Because of who I've been, because of what I've done. And I didn't, I'm, I'm young, I don't know what to say to the man except to ask him, what would forgiveness look like for, for her, for him? We talked for a while together, and then we just went on about our business. He went to take a shower. I went to take a shower next to him. You pay for these showers, and you come out. And when we came out of the shower, we used the language of baptism and starting again. And I reached up and I touched that man's forehead and I said, we can all begin again. And the spirit moved. I didn't ask him to accept Jesus Christ. I just asked him to accept that he was forgiven and that new life is possible. 4 a.m. I don't know where you'll find the truck stop. It'll be a surprise for you, brothers and sisters. You'll find God at the visitor center. You will find God in hell, but you will also be part of God's movement if you just go to the truck stop and the base camp. All roads don't lead to one kind of enlightenment. They all lead to personal and social holiness. In Christ's name, amen. Christ invites to this table all of those who truly seek uh, a change, a new start, whatever we've experienced in life. This is the table of mercy and grace and fresh beginnings. 
I invite you as you consider coming forward, first of all, there may be a person in this room. Before I invite a person to come forward and serve communion for the first time, let me just also say, there's bound to be someone in this room who needs to experience mercy today. I don't know what exactly you have experienced. When Bishop Luttrell Easterling came into this sanctuary two years ago, she said, I have this strong feeling, she told me afterward in the car, I have this strong feeling that somebody in this room is dealing with abuse. Takes one to know one. Two years ago, she said, there's somebody in that church who's hurting in that way and needs to be healed, needs to be liberated. I'm not saying that you're bringing that particular pain with you, but I invite you to think again about how to approach this table. This is not just a simple religious ritual. It is a fresh beginning, a new opportunity. And so I want to just invite you to consider that. Uh, before I even pray here, I just want to invite us to be in prayer together. And maybe you also are called to be the one to offer mercy today. Maybe for the first time, you could be the one that offers the cup of juice to some others. So if you've never done that before, I'm just going to invite you to come forward after I'm done praying. And maybe today's the day when you can serve another. Would you pray with me? God, we come into this holy place on this holy hill where we remember what it's like to be baptized. We remember the little ones who came forward. We remember the ancestors in this place sat alongside of Ambassador Barnes. We remember those saints who have showed us, oh God, what your mercy looks like. And we come to you weary living God. We come to you on a day when CNN is breathless and they're reporting of all of these rockets that are exploding over the skies of Jerusalem and Palestine. They have forgotten about the people who are dying daily in what used to be hospitals in Gaza, your Palestinian people, O oh God. And so we come with that burden in our hearts, God, a, 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 a deep anger and not sure what to do with it. But we do understand who we give it to. And so we come at this time, God, to meet you in a new way. We confess to you, God, that we have not lived as we should. We confess to you that we have not believed that your Son, our Savior, is truly the liberator. We have come with our ideas, but none of our changed principles. And so we ask God for a new ethic, a new blessing, a new anointing today. Transform us, God, through this meal so that we might transform the world for you, with you. And for that one person who is here who does not feel worthy of your grace, holy God, hug, hold, heal. Help me. Help us. And now prepare us, O oh God. As one comes from the congregation to be the one to offer the cup of mercy for the first time, we listen for your spirit, O oh God. Who will come today to offer the cup of mercy today? Who will come? Mm. Who will come? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good. It's an easy thing, God, to give you thanks for all that you have given us. We lift up a cup of blessing. Our cup overflows. Yes, it does. When we consider these children in the background who are enjoying their lives, when we consider the birds who are enjoying spring, here we are, God, fully satisfied by a good night's rest and by food and by friendship. It's easy for us to remember the ways that we've been blessed, O oh God. And when we think of the blessing you have given us in Ambassador Barnes, Amen. when we think of the other saints who have accompanied us on the journey of life. We also then think of all of those people, Sarah and Abraham, and Esther, Isaac, Jacob, Moses and Miriam. 
We think of your prophets Amos and Jeremiah, Habakkuk. We think of all of those who have shined a light of your presence in the midst of your people. We think especially of Jesus and of his life of mercy and love, a man who would walk the boundary between north side, south side, and have conversations with all of your people, table fellowship with all of them. Sin for him was not an eternal condition, but it was missing the mark. And so Jesus knew that a way for him to demonstrate your powerful love, O oh God, was through a powerful sacrifice, and so he did. He gathered with his friends at a table after he had taught them so much about mercy. And there might have been Passover elements of bread and cup. And so Jesus took that bread. He gave thanks to you, and then he broke the bread. And he offered it to all of his disciples, young and old, women and men. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. As often as you eat from this, do so in remembrance of me. And Jesus took that same cup of blessing and he gave thanks to you for all of life's blessings and yet he said, now drink from this, each one of you. This is a cup of mercy. This is my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink from this cup, remember me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in union with his offering of love as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So God, pour out your Holy Spirit on your people gathered. Your Holy Spirit is what reverses the Tower of Babel, a people who thought that they could build one high point and everybody would be just like us. You, O oh God, sent your spirit to people of differing languages, but for the first time in a long time, they understood one another because of you. Not because of what we build, O oh God, but because of you. So pour out your Holy Spirit again on your people of differing languages and cultures. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that as we eat and sense our redemption, we become little Christs. Because we see him as he is, we become that same powerful force of good in the world, personal social holiness. By your spirit, O oh God, make us one with each other so that as we forgive one another, we also know what it means to be forgiven by you. In all of these ways, you bind us into one church at one table, praying one prayer. And we humbly pray that prayer now in our native language, which we know as the prayer of Jesus, the Lord's Prayer. Hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for us, the people of God, gluten-free bread, non-alcoholic grape juice, no obstacles to participation. Still, if you don't feel today like you want to receive a piece of bread to dip into the juice, you might simply come forward and let us touch the back of your hand. I say us because I know someone will stand with me today. Yes? Someone will stand with me. Amen. 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 And after we receive these elements, you may feel led to the, to the altar, led to the table where you can light a candle, or simply back to your pew and led to lead a new life. It begins here. So come, all is prepared and all are welcome. Amen. Amen.
I was thinking there would be a children's time, and then a youngster came over to the chancel rail and kneeled beside me. I think she's got it. At least I know the parents are helping. So we'll move on to our closing song, Amazing Grace is the Right Song to Sing. I invite you to stand as you are able for hymn number 378. We'll sing. Uh, I think we're just going to do uh, four verses, and that's it. My shield and portion be. He will your shield and portion be. God is good. We have sensed God's presence here sitting beside us in the pew. And so I want to celebrate that it's not the ending but the beginning of a, of a day of worship. Uh, and so I pray that you go from this place and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up a countenance of hope on your behalf and grant you peace now and forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated.